real fondness for farmers, for the earth and for the animals that we raise. Um, a little, little bit about my training, my background, is that as an undergraduate student at University of Massachusetts, one of the courses I took for fun was animal science, and I found it to be one of the most amazing courses. It was really an intro course about animals, and it was at that point that I learned all about how pigs are born, which was the, one of the funniest videos I believe I've ever seen, because they fly out. Um, and, but my major was plant and soil science, and I really had every hope of um, being a farmer. It just turned out I wasn't suited to it, because I'm not great in the morning, and you know, when you're a farmer, you get up every morning early and you work all day. I just didn't have the bones for that, frankly. Um, but we will talk about bones today in, in the manner of broth. As uh, an agriculture student, I really came to appreciate how soil contributes to uh, human health and also to animal health. And so I have actually given you a second PowerPoint packet that is just at the very back about how soil matters and how it contributes to nutrition. And so when I talk to you today about the animals, I do want you also to always keep in mind uh, the quality of the earth upon which you are um, raising your animals, if they're out on pasture, or if you're um, purchasing feeds from someone else, how those plants were grown and on what earth that was grown on, because the nutrient composition does change based on the quality of the soil, especially the soil organic matter. So the farms that have been more, ten care more carefully tended really, in fact, have better, more nutritive foods, which then make your animals better and you can actually compete in the marketplace by having a more nutritive product to offer. Um, so today what we're gonna do is to look at the nutritional benefits of animal foods and actually spend quite a bit of time talking about how when we raise animals on pasture, how nutrition actually increases um, quite tremendously. I know that not all of you do pasture raised animals um, and I just need you to know that what we're trying to do here is really to give you a continuum of the more the animals on pasture, what some of those nutritional benefits are, and those really become marketing points for you. I think it's good news for you that meats are really a very preferred food by humans. W what we are seeing as the economy changes, and I know that we sometimes have a very uh, small sense for what the economy is. When we talk about the economy, we're talking about the American economy. But if you look at global economies, many people who previously were extraordinarily poor have a few more yen or dollars or whatever their currency is, and they're actually able to buy more food. And what we find is this research is true across almost all cultures, except those that are specifically vegetarian uh, by their spiritual cultural nature, is that when we get that extra dollar, people want to spend it on meat. And so worldwide, we have a tremendous increase in the demand for meat. One thing that you could predict from that is that we're gonna have more and more efficiencies of scale in how we raise animals, and we're going to see more and more of these huge factory farms. Those are your competitors. Small farmers are in direct competition with enormous factory farms that have thousands and tens of, tens of thousands of head. So this is, again, a marketing piece for you, is if you have a smaller farm, if you have the storybook farm, the one that tells a good story, you actually have something to sell. And people are, at least in this country, are very responsive to that, and you should speak to that. But one thing that I just want to point out, part of my, um, inf the information that I've studied over the past number of years, I am midway through a second master's degree in public health at University of Maryland in uh, public, it's uh, um, environmental health science. My perspective in that is looking at agriculture and looking at the way we raise foods and looking at sustainability issues and nutrition issues and health issues, sort of food safety as well. We are going to have to come back and look at this. I will tell you right now, we don't have best practices established. We don't actually know everything we need to know about what's the best way to raise animals, what's the best for the earth, what's the best for the people. But interestingly, some of the more modest farms tend to be better. And in fact, with dairy, Ginger was talking about, she's a recovering dairy farmer. This is such a cute expression is that dairy farms that are small actually have uh, really healthy animals. 35 is a really good number for a dairy farm. And yet yeah, that's not huge, that's not efficient in the model that we have of large scale agriculture, but that you would be comfortable having a smaller farm and that you know that you're actually gonna be helping with some of this, both the sustainability pieces and the health aspects. I wanted again to give you a global perspective of what are some of the biggest nutritional issues on earth and protein deficiency is a major issue on Earth. This is where a person is simply doesn't get enough protein in the diet. Oftentimes they also don't get calories, but 
this is the one that really causes the sort of wasting, those very scrawny skin and bones children that you see in advertisements. We do not see this in the United States typically. But it is a global problem and it affects many, many people. Iron deficiency affects everybody. This, is, this one is distributed throughout the world. This is not just a poverty issue. We have people in Montgomery County, the county that you're visiting right now, that have lots of money, they drive a fancy car, and they're iron deficient. So this one is very typical. Women and children affected more heavily than others. Zinc deficiency, huge national issue here, global issue. In children, zinc deficiency here is associated with some attention deficit problems, failure to learn effectively. Iodine deficiency. Now, iodine deficiency in the United States we solved in the 1920s by adding iodine to what? Salt. To salt. When I ask my students, and my students, um, I teach at Montgomery College, which is a campus just a few miles away from here. We have students from all over the world, 160 nations, and then we have many, many domestic students who grew up right here in this county or certainly in this state. And when I ask them, do they have iodized salt, they all go like this. What? They, have, they don't know. I said, do you use iodized table salt at home? They don't know. All right. Now, none of you are fish farmers, if I listen carefully, but sea animals, marine animals, are really where we get iodine. So both the animals and the plants, sea vegetables, kelp, seaweed, are really great sources of iodine. And any of you who are away from the ocean's edge really tend to have low iodine soils. The lowest iodine soils in the United States are the areas that are around the Great Lakes. And so in those areas, we've had goiter and iodine deficiency and thyroid problems for decades, actually for centuries, okay? <coughs> so this is the only one of all these nutrients that we really can't address with the animals that you're raising, okay? Protein, all of the animals that we heard about today, okay? The goats, the jerseys, th they're really a wonderful source of protein, a wonderful source of iron, a wonderful source of zinc. So when we're looking at big issues, and frankly, a lot of your customers don't even know about zinc, that it's just not even on their radar. A lot of them know about iron. Beef, for example, lamb, for example, the red meats are one of your most approachable ways of getting iron into pregnant women, children, people who are having trouble with iron deficiency. So your animals really are providing a wonderful source of nutrition, approachable, digestible, accessible. So proteins are a big deal. Lipids, I wanted to just address two specific types of lipids that are in trace amounts in foods, omega-3 and omega-6. So we have familiarity with the term omega-6. Just need to see some head bobs. Okay, there we go, we got some familiarity. Omega-6 is found in things like soy, corn, many nuts and seeds. Omega-3, what do you typically hear as a source for omega-3? fish oils, that's right, but also in land animals that have been raised on pasture. So this is one of those where if you have pastured animals as opposed to animals that are enclosed, some of you um, know that some of the big pig producers, their animals never see the light of day, they are eating a very controlled diet, that controlled diet doesn't have the omega-3. The animals that are out foraging, where you just sort of let them go, and they're outdoors, they have several benefits, one being that they're going to have a higher omega-3 concentration. And omega-3 deficiency plagues the United States. And we see people who have all kinds of brain issues, heart issues, eye issues, and so forth. The omega-3s, people are paying big money at Costco, big money at the Walgreens to buy bottles of fish oil pills, okay? I need you to understand that's not really a sustainable behavior, but please don't look at my cupboard because I have fish oils because I know how important they are. I have a little bit of a tease. I say to my students, look, I'm gonna tell you something really important. You need to eat fish oil, but you can't tell your friends because there's not enough. And there's less every day. You all heard that the rockfish are down this year, right? Okay, that was today's news. There aren't enough fish in the sea. We, grandmothers always said, oh, don't worry when you lose that guy. There's always, there's so many fish in the sea. There aren't so many fish in the sea. Human beings have destroyed the oceans. So one of the things we're gonna have to do nutritionally is to replace fish as a source of omega-3 or supplant it really, sort of support it. And one of the ways we can do that is to get your animals out on pasture eating a diet that is gonna have more omega-3 from plant sources that are then going to bioaccumulate in the animal's body. There are many, many B vitamins in the animal foods that you raise. And B vitamins are associated with better health. Today's newspaper reports on a study of people taking multivitamin supplements. 
Did you all see this study? You were all too busy driving for three hours to get here. I apologize for the long drive. That's what we live here, right? That the driving that just ruins our lives. No matter, no matter what field of study people have, the conversation is always, how long was your drive? Oh, my God, the guy ran the red light. Did you see that? <laughs> All right. So B vitamins are important for mood. They're important for heart. I, can just, I mean, I could just actually go on and have a laundry list. Today's newspapers are reporting on a study that says that people who take multivitamins have a 8% reduced risk for cancer. May I suggest that if you eat real foods that contain those vitamins, you can reduce your risk for cancer 8%, right? So we need to feed people better. I do take supplements. I just do because I feel as though I can't get enough in my diet. And part of that is we have degraded our soils. And we are selling foods, animal foods, that have been po poorly fed. And your clients, once they taste good animal meat, have a really hard time going back and eating the cheap stuff. Like they're just like... They don't need meatless Mondays to want to not eat some of that meat because it just doesn't have the flavor. It doesn't have um, the value. And that is because your taste buds are actually extraordinarily powerful detectors of all the values that are built up from the earth into those animals. So lots of B vitamins. When we look at minerals, copper and iron and zinc are particularly interesting. For those of you who are doing birds, I heard we had some ducks. Um, that the animals who move their wings have one of the reasons we started confining birds. There are a million reasons we did that. But one was that when they move their wings, you get dark spots around the meat, right? Why is that? That's because it's myoglobin. Myoglobin is a rich source of iron. It's a wonderful protein, but it makes the meat look dark. And we have this entire world of Americans who think the only meat from a bird should be white. And they run, they run away from the thigh. Oh my gosh, it's so fatty. And let me tell you, it's fabulous food. It cooks up beautifully. Thighs are great food. The best chicken, when people say, oh my God, what is this? It's the thigh, right? And the wings with those dark brown spots from the activity have more mineral nutrition. You don't need to apologize for this. Say that's an indication of health of the bird, right? So learn how to describe those brown streaks from the activity in the poultry wing. All right, now this is, uh, first of all, I love plants. Remember, my, my background is in plants. But plant foods are much more difficult to digest. All of the fibers that are in plants slow the rate of digestion and actually physically bind to minerals. We call chelation, where they are bound up and they're not available. So a person on a diet that is plant-based and has very little meat has a lot of trouble getting their minerals. This is why we have vegetarians who are anemic, vegetarians with osteoporosis, vegetarians with, okay? And it's also a reason why women are at risk because women eat less food because the average woman, this is always the part where I start to giggle, the average woman is smaller than the average man. Not, a, not average. <laughs> so, but, but typically what we have is we're not bringing in enough food over the course of the day to bring in all the iron that we need, okay? Men eat many more calories, maybe 500 more a day. Uh, a really active guy could bring in a thousand or more calories more than the typical woman, in which case he's exposed to more foods that are going to bring his iron up. Woman, women have a higher need for iron because every month they lose iron with their menstrual period. So it's like they eat less and they lose more. And you could see how the difference would be that we actually do have men who have too much iron if they're eating supplemented foods. We actually have to be careful, careful about not over supplementing with iron. But with women, it's just like, it's like the leaky faucet. It's like you just can't keep up. You keep losing. And so meats are going to be wonderful for women with anemia, for women who are pregnant, for women who are trying to rebuild what they're losing. Zinc is going to be uh, an important one also for growth. And children who are low in zinc do not grow as rapidly or as tall. Now, you all know this expression, you are what you eat, right? There's, there, I don't think there's a person I've ever given a presentation to that they're like, never heard that before. It's, it's, it's an overused expression, but in fact, I love it. Because then I can say, well, you're really what your food ate. You're really what your food ate. Is it possible to turn this front light off? I'm just thinking we get a better uh, image. Aren't those beautiful? That's Pennsylvania. We were beautiful, beautiful animals. When we put an animal on pasture, what we're really doing is putting this animal on a mixed greens diet. And um, so there are lots of different species. You know, it, you know they do this. Um, in research, they'll just take a great big 
um, wooden frame and drop it down and they'll have students climb around on their hands and knees and try and identify all the different species that are within that square meter. And what you'll find is you might find 40 different species of grasses, alfalfa, all different kinds of things growing in one square meter. So um, for an unsophisticated person, they just think grass is one thing. It's like it's a monoculture. It's just one diet. But this is not what's out in your field. It's all kinds of stuff all mixed together and the occasional insect. So it's not a completely vegetarian diet. It's a mostly like 95, 98, 99, 99, 5 percent, but there are little trace amounts of insects that get in there. These have really interesting nutritional profiles, and these are going to, again, be added in. Vitamin D, you might describe as sort of the trendy vitamin, the darling of the nutritional world right now. Vitamin D has been important in our understanding of human needs for a really long time. But we didn't used to raise animals inside structures. And what has happened is we didn't have to talk about vitamin D so much because vitamin D was there. It was in the animal foods that people ate. About 100 years ago, we started um, to really understand how important vitamin D was. And once they figured out that rickets developed in children that were um, raised in areas that were north, away from the sun, so for example, a place like Detroit or Pittsburgh where people wear a lot of clothes, they did industrial jobs, they were indoors, children worked instead of playing, we started to add vitamin D to milk. So I don't probably have to tell you that milk is actually not a particularly good vehicle for D. The mother doesn't put D into her milk. We add it after the fact to cow's milk, goat's milk, and so forth. But if the animal is raised outdoors, the animal will store vitamin D in its liver and in its fat. And so I just love this to death. Bacon is a good source of vitamin D. Yay. <laughs> if, if the animal is raised outdoors. So if you have those pigs where we have Lord knows how many pigs inside one shelter and they never see the light of day, the only D they're going to get is what somebody deliberately put into their diet, and you're assuming that they've done that. So we took away a value, and we actually culturally, we came to be known as the, f the fat-ophobic nation. We're afraid of fat in our nation, and fat is not something that you should be afraid of. Fat has tremendous health benefits for you, but one of them is that they will bioaccumulate vitamin D synthesized with ultraviolet irradiation. It's really a cholesterol starting molecule that goes through multiple steps. It involves both the liver and the kidneys. It's a multi-stage process that starts with the sun, all right? Separately, in case anybody here has a teenage daughter who's doing indoor tanning, that is way more dangerous than sunshine. It's really a problem, and th we are seeing cancers as a result of that. Separately, there's a balancing act. I don't have time to give you the other lecture, which is quite fascinating, which is the balancing act between vitamin D and folic acid, but too much sun exposure in a person who doesn't have enough pigmentation will result in folic acid degradation, meaning breakdown. Folic acid is important for reproduction, and we're seeing birth defects among people who are doing the sun tanning in the tanning booths because they're breaking down their folate. So my um, ambition here, for those of you who are doing um, uh, grass-fed and then grain finish. That's a, that's a fairly nice product because you get enough fat in the animals that people can cook it more easily. It's a lot more like the commercial um, products. But the grass-fed animals really have some, the, the grass feeding has some real benefits to your animals. And that is because this is really the diet those animals were um, evolved to consume, all right? They have greater health among the animals that are on pasture for more of their days of their life the animals actually live longer because we don't have trouble with acidosis, for example, in the cattle. Um, the animals do grow more slowly. And just to give you, a, I'm not sure that it's a, a true parallel, but it's an interesting observation. In humans, when we give them breast milk, they grow more slowly than if we give them infant formula. Now, they end up about the same size by one year, but it's really interesting that the rate of growth is different. And I always ask, you know, what's really better for the animal? And probably to grow at the more normal rate is, you know, like what is, I'm going to guess that breastfeeding would be the normal rate. So 
this is the problem where you have two moms in the same you know baby group and the one watches the other and the baby's going bigger and bigger and bigger and it's like maybe I should feed my baby formula. Well, in this case, we like the slow growth. It's a more appropriate rate of growth for the animal. Okay, and some of you have seen what we can do with chickens, where the chickens actually are no longer able to stand up because the body weight. It, it, it's like they grew faster than their than their legs and and uh, under structure can hold them up. That's frightening to me that we that we push them so hard and we did it all for money is is the issue. So the other thing is that we're finding that there's less pressure on the environment. There are some interesting and provocative studies about how as the animal feeds that this is stimulating growth of the plant which is pulling carbon dioxide out of the earth into the ground into the plant. So there's some real interesting cycle, carbon cycles that as it's going to take years to get these to the right place. In the meantime, we can just start doing this and see what happens. The next series of slides are going to look at comparisons of the grass-fed versus the commercial in a variety of animals. And this first slide is looking at the fat composition. I'm going to start with an assertion that I think fat is actually good for you, but I think that there are certain kinds of fats that are better for you. And the kinds of fats that I think are particularly good for you are going to be the omega-3s from natural foods that have come up through the food chain. And I actually like saturated fats. We could talk a bit about the value to, to you from saturated fats. But the other thing is many Americans actually do consume too many fats from too many sources and that the balance of those fats is different. So if you have a grain-fed um, steer, for example, that animal is going to be higher in omega-6 than it is in omega-3 because the grain was high in 6. And it's just bioaccumulating it. So if it's too much six, we actually are better off with less fat. So this is the part that we could go on for probably three hours just on the fat dynamics. And um, so I'm okay with fat. I think fat has health benefits. So this one where it just says it's lower in fat does require a little uh, elaboration to go through it. This is a grain-fed beef loin. This is a commercial chicken breast. So you'll have the two, these two industries fight with each other all the time. Chicken saying, we're thinner than you are because we have less fat, right? But if you look here, this is a grass-fed beef that's a really nice one. This is bison. We had bison. Who was the bison person? Okay. So bison is very low in fat, but it also means you have to cook it a lot more carefully because there's not enough fat there to keep it. Um, you, you have to know what you're doing. But this is the kind of food that we always had, and it's really only in the last you know, half century that we had these fatty animals that actually cooked up so nicely. Real quick aside about what people perceive and like about meats is that um, I have students who come from other nations whose context, their understanding of what meat is, is that meat should be chewy. And they have a really difficult time with American meats that are so soft. They're like, it frightens them, right? It frightens them. And they're like, this isn't, so this isn't meat. There's something wrong with this. So I need you to really think about when you have a target of what you're trying to achieve with your product, that maybe one thing that you could do if you do have some um, more resistant, more you know, chewy kind of meats, maybe you need a new customer base and they're gonna like your product and that you don't have to you know, twist like a pretzel to make, some, make something that's difficult to make that you could actually just change who you sell to. And I would have you look into some of the ethnic markets um, to see where you might be able to reach out there. Now, um, this is um, looking at wild game. This is grass-fed beef looking at wild game, elk, deer, antelope, and this is the cattle. And they really are all nice and low in fat. Uh, we do have some issues. I happen to think that these, these are really great animals to eat, except now that we do have some trouble with uh, some of the prion diseases uh, in those animals. And so people are having to be more cautious about hunting. Boy, what a shame that is. What a shame that is, uh, because those were lovely foods. Now, essential fats, let me just give you a brief definition of what an essential fat is. An essential fat is a structure, it's a molecule that your body is incapable of making. So you have to eat it. You can eat it as a part of a food or you can take it as a part of a fish oil pill, but you can't make it, you need it, so therefore it's essential, okay? In nutrition, we have lots of different uses of that same word essential, and that's a little frustrating, but here it just simply means you can't make it, you gotta eat it. And this is giving you a sense for where the essential fats are in these different foods. This is breaking it out between the two. And there are two different, let's call them families or clusters or groups. There are many different molecules in this family, the omega-3. There are many different molecules in this family, omega-6. The one in America that we get too much of is six. And the one that we get too little of is three. 
And what we were adapted to evolutionarily, like what we were exposed to over thousands of years, and what our enzyme systems are adapted to, what our metabolic systems are adapted to, was probably closer to a one-to-one -one match of these. Look at these disproportionate numbers. Grain-fed cattle put people at risk because they push the sixes. They tip you out of balance. When you're tipped out of balance, the kinds of health issues we see over time, meaning over years of that kind of diet, cancers, inflammatory issues like uh, arthritis, lots of issues. Grass-fed cattle, look at the difference. Just shockingly different and better. So the more time on pasture, the better for your, it's better for your animal, and it's better for the consumer. Um, antelope, interestingly, I'm not sure why that one's so disproportionately high, and um, I'm curious about that but I don't know the answer on that one. Now, the omega-3s, um, as I mentioned just briefly, are anti-inflammatory. So they actually help prevent cancers. We also are using them to help treat cancers after the fact, but we always wanna treat things before the horse is out of the barn, okay? Cancers are a hard thing to manage. Diabetes and heart disease, big issues. Heart disease is more an issue of people having too little three and too much six than it is from too much cholesterol. I need you to know this whole thing around cholesterol is really misunderstood, and it's, it's a sad thing that we have. Virtually every kid in America thinks cholesterol is bad. Doesn't mean they don't eat it, but they see it as a villain and don't understand that cholesterol is the basis for really important structures in your body, cell walls, uh, beginning materials of hormones, and so forth. You need cholesterol, okay, so it's not the bad guy. Omega-3s support brain structure. People who are low in omega-3, and I'll tell you a story in just a moment, they are depressed, they have heart disease, their brains don't work well. They might have attention deficit. The most recent research in the last three, four years, looking at the suicides among our military, and I think you all know that we have a true epidemic of suicide. They are able now to do body composition analysis, analyzing, remember, let, let me go back to this. You are what you ate. When we analyze your body fat, we know what you ate. We don't have to say, we don't have to ask you a question about what you ate. We can document it because it's what loaded into you. The people who suicided are extraordinarily low, statistically greatly lower in omega-3. What's the military doing about it? They are addressing this. They have, they have groups of people, including those right here in Rockwell, Maryland at the National Institutes of Health who are researching how to get more omega-3 into the diets, into the MREs, into the, they say it, this is a problem. They see it. They're ahead of the game on this. Okay, but I teach young people, and I have I see a lot of apathetic, not quite we call them not ready for prime time, you know, like sort of, I don't know, right? So it's like uh, the diets. I know I'm not talking about your children. I have two girls myself. This is a problem because where does the omega three in the baby come from? From the mom's body. When we're making the baby, we have to take these nutrients build them into the baby and then when we feed the baby at the breast we continue to do this infant formula does not have enough omega-3 the reason is it costs money and the infant formula companies have played a very sophisticated research game to keep this out of the marketplace 20 years ago 30 years ago countries that we would describe as poor countries demanded that omega-3s be put into infant formula and our industry held back. So we have, you know, it's a game. They're still giving out free infant formula in hospitals today. We've been working that issue. My master's degree, 752 years ago, close to 30 years ago, was on breastfeeding promotion. And we knew then you should never give free formula away at the hospital. We still do it in 2012, going on 13. All right, so the omega-3s are huge. This is a really good story for all of you. It's a really good story for all of you. Now, if you have your animals not on pasture, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna find sources of omega-3 to put into the feed for those animals to help with that. And you're gonna pay some money to have some lab tests done to document what the fatty acid composition of your um, animal foods are. Uh, and actually, which, is it, it might be West Virginia University that does those tests. I'm not sure, maybe you can. Virginia Tech. It's Virginia Tech, okay, thank you. 
All right. So once this is the this is the animal that you're up against. When people do the feedlot where they send them off, it's like we grow them up to this age and then ship them off. Look what happens to the omega threes. These are days. 28 days, 56, 84, 112. They're gone because they're being replaced. You need to understand that your fatty tissue and the animals that you are raising, their fatty tissue is dynamic and it is reflective of the recent diet. So with omega-3s, actually with a lot of nutrients, it's not like you can say, well, when I was a kid, I ate very well. It'd be like, well, good for you, but what did you do lately, right? This is what did we do for this animal lately? And it just drops right out. This is looking at vitamin E, E, and this is butter um, with regard to E, A, and carotenes. Carotenes are the orange colored pigments that are precursors to vitamin A. This is already made vitamin A. Animals make already made vitamin A. This is the form you need. Vegetarians try to get carotenes instead of preformed vitamin A because this is really not in plant foods. Many people cannot convert from carotene to vitamin A. So animal foods trump plants time and time again. This is one of them. This is vitamin E in your grass-fed butter. Beats out the conventional A and carotene, all stronger. If you have butter with more carotene, you tell me what that butter looks like. It's yellower, is it not? Actually, that's a preferred thing. Your customers will look. If they see two, they see the pale butter and the yellow butter. They're reaching for this one, right? Okay, so this one is E, just shows you the grass-fed is much higher. Vitamin E is a very powerful antioxidant nutrient that protects you at the cellular level. More on vitamin E. All right, so pastured eggs are also much more nourishing, uh, whether it's goose, duck, uh, whatever type of egg we have. This one is showing you a bioaccumulation of the carotenes. It's much richer color egg. Um, there's much more vitamin D in animals out on pasture than in confinement. Eggs can be a source of vitamin D. It's a really nice thing. The, the eggs indoors, unless they're loading it in, aren't going to have it. And I need you to know something. Synthetic vitamin D that we put into diets is not the same as the outdoor that you make on your own or that your duck or your hen is doing outside. Uh, there's less saturated fat. I'm not afraid of saturated fat, but you get some other nice fats just to blend changes here. More vitamin A, um, more omega-3s, and way more beta-carotene. Um, lots more vitamin uh, B. Folic acid and B12 are remarkably important for nervous system function, for heart function. People who are depressed need more of this. People with heart disease need more of this. People who are making babies need more of this. Children need more of this. this is, these are everyday nutrients. Why do I say everyday? Because B vitamins are brought in, you absorb them from the diet, you circulate them through the blood, and then what happens is the kidneys clear your blood several times every single day, every hour rather. And they say, do I want this? Keep or toss, keep or toss. And the B vitamins, your kidneys say, oh, I'm done, kicks them out. So you have to bring in more the next day and more the next day. B vitamins are to be spread through the diet, across days, across your hours. You just keep bringing them in. You can't store them for later. B12 of all of them is the one that can be stored to the greatest extent, but some of you don't have the capability to do that well. So B12 is not stored well by all people. It's not an equal uh, opportunity thing. Some people are great at it, and they could go three years without eating B12. And some of you just have to keep bringing it in. Folic acid is going to be cleared every single day, and you have to bring it in the next day. So the diet really needs to be you just keep bringing this in. B12, nervous system, cell division, really both important for moods. And I'll point out to you that we have a lot of problem with mood disorders in the United States. So just a summary, um, this really is just from the, all the previous slides. Beta carotene is higher, vitamin E is higher, thiamine and riboflavin, calcium, magnesium, and potassium. These are all higher in the pastured food than those once we take them off pasture and start to feedlot them. Higher in omega-3s, healthier ratio between the threes and sixes, higher some CLA, which is an anti-cancer uh, uh, positive on body composition. This is one of the fatty acids really important. There's something called vexenic acid, which is a precursor to this one. You have higher levels of both of these, which is very nice, lower sats, and then lower in total fat. So basically, a very preferred nutritional model and a really good argument for you in the marketplace to say, what I have is actually better than what the competitor is. And when somebody says, yeah, but I can go over to name of store and get this for $2, $3, $5 less a pound, you can say, you sure can, but you're not getting this.
I want to talk briefly about bone broths and then I how are we doing on time? So I should, we should go to Q&A pretty soon? Okay. Why don't I just stop here? This is probably a good place. Um, I do want to point out about uh, broth is that broth is remarkably nutritive. It isn't just flavored water. When you're cooking broth, you are pulling soluble proteins, you're bringing collagen and gelatin, you're bringing nutrients into what we think of as the soup or the water part. If you add a little lemon or vinegar in cooking, you actually pull more of the mineral and more of those soluble proteins into the liquid and it's more nourishing yet. Those foods are really good for you. When you, somebody uses a soup base, those little powders that are flavored with MSG and other things, and they call it soup, that's not soup. That's not a true broth. These broths are remarkably healthy. They are health foods. They take time to make. That is one of the ways you can sell bones to people is to say, take the time to make broth. You really have a value there. And you don't have to say you're organic. You don't have to say you're grass fed. The bones are really valuable almost regardless of how we raise them, okay? So bones are really something I would have you pushing. You're gonna, you are gonna use recipes in the marketplace. You are gonna do tastings. And if you don't do that well, there's no reason you can't partner with a friend, somebody's daughter, some cousin, some neighbor who wants to do something with some of their hours. They can come with you to farmer's markets. They can be your salesperson. You don't have to do all this yourself. You know, if what you really love is to be with your animals, partner with someone else to do that work. Why don't we go ahead and do Q&A? I know that you've been thinking something. Those are actually, so they summarize from a lot of the pages. I, there, you want to go to the... The, the bibliography has a, a lot of these studies. It does not have all of them. Oh, okay. So um, you're looking at one just before the broth? Before the broth. Well, it's on the title. The slide before the bone broth slide, if you back up one. Can you explain the bone broth? Okay. Can you explain the bone broth? Can you explain the bone broth? Owen 2009. Is that, is that a question? Yeah, just go in. So one of the ways to do research, um, I actually like Google Scholar fairly well. And they made it much harder to find. For those of you who used Google Scholar previously, it's, you have to go into Google, and it'll say more, has all, all across the band, it has all the different things, and then this says more. You go into more, and then you have to drop way to the bottom. You're looking for Google Scholar. Put in that last name, okay. and then the date, and, and it will pull up anything by that researcher. Okay. Now, what happens is you don't have full access. Sometimes you, there'll be a PDF that will be the entire document. Sometimes there'll be an abstract. Um, if you're associated with an institution, um, for example, your own college library would be able to pull things. But Google Scholar is outside of that, and it's a free and open system. And I have no idea why they buried it, because it used to be immediately available. And I guess they just offered so many new services that it just got displaced. But that's how I would have you start. Yeah, yes. Um, how would those two intersect? I, I know you say it's all different. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's actually a great question. Um, and I don't know specifically how much is lost when you go from the from hay to the, the fresh pasture. Ginger may have a good one on that. Yeah, so there's a couple of things. So you can see the three of that, that the weight is there for you to pull with. Into the hay, you know that if the hay pulls your ear, it's going to lose its, its uh, writing process. So um, you can't go ahead and do the analysis. It's like a very variable thing that you need. Whatever you yeah, and so I'll just make a comment for the microphone that Ginger says that actually um, over time as hay is stored, uh, vitamins are lost, and that a year or more you will have a statistical loss in those nutrients. Mineral content doesn't change. You know, the thing about minerals is you can burn the hay to ash, and the minerals are there, you just eat the ash, which was a very traditional way of uh, power boosting foods in traditional societies. They would burn twigs that they particularly liked. Juniper is used a lot in the Native American um, food ways as a way of power boosting nutrition. Um, and it also confers a real interesting flavor. So there are some you know, fry breads that still use dried juniper and, and that. But so minerals, you can wash them away, which is why we ask people not to pour off cooking water um, because you lose the minerals there. They get leached out of the food into the water. So what we used to call pot liquor, you know, I see some familiarity in them. 
that's actually very nutritive. The only pot liquor people don't like are the ones with, with sulfur, like uh, cabbage water or something, unless you're specifically making a cabbage product. Additional questions, thoughts? Yes. Well, so, it, okay, so we're, the question is about zinc and about zinc from the soil into the animal and the needs of both pigs and humans with regard to zinc. And the answer is both pigs and humans need zinc. We don't grow without it. Um, plants are stunted without zinc. I actually had, that's in the other slide set. But zinc is in the soil, and in fact, the people who have too much zinc in the soil are those who are using human sewage um, as fertilizer because it ends up in our excrement. So if you all remember the whole milorganite as a product that was from the uh, Milwaukee sewer system where they were really composting it and making a uh, soil treatment, is that that was fine if you were gonna use it for, let's say, ornamentals, things that were not gonna be consumed. But in fact, the soil became very overly loaded with zinc and it was then being pulled into the plants. Not an issue if you don't eat the plants, but if you eat them, that was a problem. And so zinc does, come from the soil and move up through plants or and then into the people who eat those plants. So um, some soils will have more zinc than others, just like some will have more copper than others. And some of that is actually, I think, one of the best arguments ever for eating a diverse diet is that the soil profile <coughs> differs, especially around these micronutrients. So there's some soils that are depleted in selenium and some that are high. So when we look at grain, for example, in the United States, in when we're making recommendations about where to get selenium, and selenium is a trace mineral very important for, for detoxification and um, antioxidation, is that our grain supply is very high in it because from the Midwest all the way into, let's say, Seattle, this sort of bread basket where we grow a great deal of our wheat, those soils are almost toxic in selenium. Like the animals who eat plants off that land actually get something called staggers because they're like poisoned with selenium, but it's a great food source for us. But if you grow wheat in Great Britain, there's no selenium in the soil. So their wheat does not have selenium. So if you think about this, it's really nice to trade soils by moving food around. And, and it's a little bit of a sustainability issue about you know how much do we want to pay for transportation. But we've gotten pretty efficient at moving food in large amounts. So one argument for eating something that's from far away is that you might get a nutrient that you wouldn't otherwise get. So, no, I'm okay on time right now. So if people want to do uh, a little bit about broth, or do you want me to pull up that soil um, piece that talks about how nutrients load into sort of plant versus animal needs? Or do you want to just do more Q&A? Broth. broth. Okay, let's go for it. Yeah, so, the, so your, your question is what's happened? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to pull it up because it will change her, her captasia. So let me just, this is an interesting thing. I, I think this is pretty straightforward. Imagine that I just have a container of soil right here. And the same group of soil I'm going to plant and harvest from every year, year after year. And what I'm going to do when I fertilize, I'm going to put an NPK. I just took out, now I took out magnesium, I took out potassium, I took out, uh, think of all the things I'm taking out, I'm taking out zinc, I'm taking out selenium, I'm taking out calcium out of the soil and I'm putting back in one, two, three, one, two, three. It's simply a matter of depletion. Also, minerals move through the soil. They, they actually move with water. So some soils, uh, when we're using irrigation where it's really low moisture environments, those ones are building up minerals because there's not enough leaching Right, so they have toxic levels of sodium and chloride and other things. But when we are over cropping, we are taking, we're just basically putting into to the food. I'll give you the analogy. Uh, the woman who has delivered eight babies in seven years 
has fewer nutrients to offer that last baby. And uh, that sounds a little fresh to describe it that way, but we absolutely see increase in nutrient-related deficiencies in the babies and all kinds of things that go along with that anemias and so forth because we basically gave up. We gave those nutrients off to that baby. Same thing we're doing with the, the soil. And so what happens is we can hold the nutrients in the soil better with soil organic material. So people who are doing m better management of their soil are holding minerals more effectively. Simultaneously, less toxicity. So heavy metals are lower in better managed soil and the nutritive ones are higher. So it's an interesting thing where it's sort of like everybody wins on that. All right, let's just click real quickly through the broth slides to talk about a few things. Um, bone broths are remarkably typical across cultures. So we see them everywhere. People will use birds, they will use fish, they will use uh, lamb or uh, veal or beef. And what you're doing is you're actually pulling nutrients out of those bones that you can't get otherwise. So you're making, you're, you're, a, you're adding a value, right? You can't gnaw on a bone and get what's there. But if we cook it, if we roast it, if we pull that nutrition out using a liquid and especially with a touch of acid, we are pulling some things that, are, um, that have been described as remedies. Think about how soup culturally is talked about. You know, when you're sick, you have soup. The kind of soup you want is really soup. It's not soup flavored water. And that distinction is really important. Here in Montgomery County, we have a lot of restaurants that are really based on soup that come from the Vietnamese culture. And those soups are P-H-O is the way it will say on the sign, but you say pho, which sounds a touch rude. Um, fabulous from bone soups, and they tend to make chicken broth based or beef broth based soups. So I tell my students, if you're sick, go to one of those, stu one of those stores and buy some and bring it home because otherwise you're going to have to cook for 12 hours or six hours to get a really good soup. Um, those, are, those tend to be cooked for 24 hours, the pho soups, which is a very long cooking time. Um, so it's classic remedy, and part of it is because it is so supportive of so many of your systems. Okay, The gastrointestinal tract is benefiting from some of the components. Joints are skin, lungs, muscle, and blood. So it really is sort of a whole body remedy. There are two classic types of broths, the white ones where you start with uncooked bones, and the brown ones where you've roasted the bones first. And what's happening here is there's a caramelization, a browning of those small amounts of carbohydrates that are there that actually then confer color and a more sweet taste to the soup. A lot of people like these for like roasted uh, turkey soup uh, would be a nice one. You can use all kinds of bones to do this. Okay? And so all of you have animals that you're selling that you could, um, duck is another one that you could have in there. Um, this is just to show you what is not soup, but this is what most restaurants rely on because it's cheap and it's fast and because their customers don't know better, right? If the soup is made with one of these, I will tell you because I will have nervous system problems the whole rest of the day. I won't sleep well that night. I'll say, oh, darn it, they use MSG. Um, we're going to start out with water. You use, start with cold water and you're bringing it up to temperature. You're going to use vinegar. You can also use lemon juice. This acid is helping to solubilize the calcium, so you have more calcium in that liquid broth. It's also pulling out the soluble proteins, the gelatins, the collagen, and you're going to simmer it for a number of hours. There are as many ways to make broth as there are cooks, and please don't see me as the authority on broth. I'm here to say this is good for you. It's good for your customers. It is a, it's, it's, a, it's actually a nice behavior. People feel good when they make soups. Um, the best soups will be rich in what is called extracted collagen or gelatins, and these are chicken feet. I have students who've never seen chicken feet, and I have other students who kill their own chickens. That's, I have every range of what's out there. But the typical American kid didn't grow up with a pot full of chicken feet on their stove. Okay, And I do tell a funny story about my, my younger daughter, who, who will be 25 this year. Uh, when she was a teenager, her boyfriend came over, and he said, oh, it smells great, and he tipped over and looked into the pot, and I had about 30 chicken feet in there, and this young man just went, whoa, and, you know, danced away from the stove, and he's like, oh, my God, and he had his head in his hands, and he did eat that soup later, and he did admit that it was quite amazing, um, but, you know, I had to look for those feet. They weren't at the giant grocery store, giant being the, the regional um, store here. They didn't have them by me because I live in Bethesda, which is inside the Beltway, where I guess we don't use chicken feet. I had to go outside the Beltway to buy the chicken feet. Um, but you get some pretty interesting compounds, these gly uh, glycosaminoglycans that are very important for building joint, uh, rebuilding joints as well. 
And so I recommend very much that people be fed these kinds of foods throughout life. They help you build better, stronger bones to begin with, hold on to what you have as you age, and also help with the um, relationship, the joints between bones so that people have less problems. I think you have all noticed that there are many, many handicapped parking spots in America. It's not just because we have regulations that define that we must have them. It's because we have so many people who need them that we had to have rules for these people. Why are we having so many people with joint problems? One is that we are not feeding them the very materials they need to build their bodies. We stopped making real soups. Think how often people had real soups 100 years ago. You wouldn't think to throw away a carcass without getting another use from it. You just wouldn't. It would be irresponsible. But food is so cheap now, comparative to what it was, that people throw food away all the time. Oh, it's too much work. Talk. Okay, so the um, acid is really particularly important for the minerals. Most Americans are low in minerals. This is an important piece. Could you work how much to add? Could you you know, you can just, a teaspoon or two. It's, you don't have to use a lot. It's not, it is not a lot, no. There are soups that have actually quite a bit of lemon or, or uh, acid because of what they're trying to achieve as a flavor experience. But no, the, you won't have a sense that it's there. And you could even, some people just take a half a lemon and drop it in. Okay. Um, very nutrient-dense food. And I, I just have to say this. I, years ago, I worked in a um, nutrition program for women and children. And there was, for the other people who were dietitians who worked there, they were very disdainful of broth. They, you know, they would see these families that came from other cultures who would say they fed their children soup. And they were like, oh, they're just giving these kids water. And I was like... No, it's not water. There's real beauty. There's real nutritional beauty in a broth. So um, you can also concentrate them. You can have little cubes of broth that you keep in the freezer, and I recommend this very, very strongly because you can throw just one cube into other foods. You know, you made a pot of chili. Whatever it is, you throw this cube in, and you have much better flavor, okay, more complex flavors, m more nutrition, and it's easy to do. The minerals that are in bone broths include calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, sulfur, fluoride, sodium, and potassium. Sulfur is really important to detoxification, and it's almost never talked about uh, when people are talking about nutrition. Glycoso, glycosa, amino glycans, are things that include chondroitin sulfate, keratin sulfate, and hyaluronic acid. These help you build cartilage. So these are the ones that are so important for your joints. The amino acids that are so interesting are glycine, proline, and hydroxyproline. Here's the funny thing. I told you earlier about a word essential. These are not essential amino acids, but in fact, they are remarkably important for detoxification and for healing. So when you are sick or injured, these are actually essential. But the physicians that treat Americans were taught that there were two lists of amino acids, the essentials and the non-essentials. These are on the non-essentials, so they pay no, never mind. But who needs these are the sick people, which is one of the reasons these are healing foods. So this is why it's worth your time to get that chicken in the pot or the bones, the veal bones in the pot. Um, and so they all are really contributing to healing. Um, that's about the end of the slide set. We're also out of time. Is there one last question? Here we go. Yeah, so you're always better off with fresh. Frozen is better than canned. We have real issues. We don't have time right now to talk about linings of cans, but we have some real environmental health issues around canned foods. The glass jars, if you're going to be making your own stuff, glass jars are always better, always better. Um, and most of the, I, and I have some of these prepackaged ones. You want to read the labels very carefully about what are all the ingredients. Um, yeah, and some have more sodium than others, but, but you really, when you make your own, you have much more control over what they are. And, and so I, what I would say is you can do a mix. You're always, I always describe nutrition on a continuum, so it's absolutely perfect to, oh my goodness, this is terrible, <laughs> right? And so you're always reaching this way toward perfection. You don't have to be perfect. You just say most of the time I make decisions on this end of the continuum. And I would do, I'll give you oatmeal as the example, okay? The, the powdered oatmeal that comes in the packet is way over here because it's really highly processed, teeny tiny particles, pre-cooked, processed, sometimes added ingredients. The one that's got, you know, like the uh, McCann's Irish oatmeal that's great big chunks, you can see like maybe one, one oat groat was cut into seven pieces, right? And it takes 30 minutes to cook. And when you eat it, it's chewy and hard and like still work to do. That's the continuum, and you want to be on this end of the continuum more often than not. 
because the American diet is way on the totally refined continuum, stored for a long time, nutrients are degraded, and then all of the packaging issues. And the packaging is really one of our concerns. You are so un-American. So what happens is some of the vitamins will break down over time. They do, There's, but, but you stop some aging once you seal it because you're, you're basically, oxygen is one of the biggest breakdown stresses for vitamins, light also. So if you have clear glass, then you're gonna store them in a dark place. And I, I always, you know, I always tease my students about the refrigerator, you know, you open the door and the light's on. I said, but, so you're like, try and peek again, is it on when I close the door? But so if you're storing in a storage room that the light is off most of the time, it's not an issue. But you wouldn't, for example, store a canned product in the glass jar on a, on a window sill because the light will break down the B vitamins. They're very sensitive. Riboflavin, this, we learned this 70 years ago, that riboflavin breaks down in milk in a glass bottle. And so the cardboard container is actually better than the glass, though we love the glass. There's just the most gorgeous look of milk in a glass bottle but the B vitamins do break down. Okay, I wanna thank you so much for your time. Um, we have our instructor. Thank you so much, Karen. We really wanna thank Karen for coming in and uh, Karen for coming and her expertise. And again, I didn't see an email contact on any of the sheets, yeah. but um, I have cards now. And also, again, she has a webpage, so you can go out and find her on the web. And uh, if you need to contact or follow up with me, thank yeah, you so probably much. Probably email plus me is better. My website is kind of I need but some help. I need one of my students. There <laughs> you go. But again, so much information. Thank you very yeah, much. And you need this. Yeah. And uh, so while we're we're talking.